If it's okay, I'm going to make a few closing remarks and some uh, expressions of gratitude at the end of the uh, invitation. When we're done with that, I'll just uh, say just a few things to you of a personal nature and get right into the lesson this evening. You may think I am uh, maybe had a, a strange childhood or that uh, there were things that affected me in an unusual way. And when I show you this next picture and tell you about it, you'll know why. This was one of my favorite sources of reading when I was a boy, Mad Magazine. And uh, Alfred E. Newman, who was the uh, character for Mad Magazine, had two slogans. Often you'd see a bust of Alfred E. Newman, and underneath it, it would have one of two statements. It would either have this, what, me worry, or this one, which is much appropriate, really appropriate thought for our lesson this evening. To know me is to love me. We're looking at the secret of loving tonight. I'm one more time going to go back to the text, and one more time I'm going to set up how we got here and why this is important to all of us. Jesus promised us abundant life. He said, if you live in me, you'll have not just life, but abundant life. John chapter 10 and verse 10 says, that's why I came, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. We shouldn't be living mediocre lives. We shouldn't be living normal lives as the world views normality. There should be something different about our lives. And what is it? It's learning to do our duty. What did God intend us to do? He intended us to bear fruit. We saw that in John chapter 15. So if I bear fruit, I'll truly live. But what's the secret to fruit bearing? Well, it is abiding, learning how to abide in the vine. And what's the secret to abiding? Well, it's obeying. If I'll obey him, then I will abide. And if I abide, I'll bear fruit. And if I bear fruit, I'll live. But what's the secret to obeying? Last night, we shared that together. It's loving It's learning to love the Lord. If we'll love the Lord, then we'll obey Him. And it won't be burdensome and it won't be difficult because loving the Lord will lead us to keeping His commandments. He said that. But what's the secret to really loving the Lord the way we talked about it last night? And that's what we're going to look at this evening. So I'm back in John chapter 15. And I invite you to look at the first 15 verses. We're going to read the larger section of this as we've done a couple of times before. Now you're welcome to read along or you're welcome to listen. But I want you to hear not Ralph speaking, but Ralph sharing the words of Jesus. If he were here tonight, I think these are the very kinds of words and the way he would word it that he would speak to us if he were here. That's pretty exciting. So here's what he said. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. So every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear fruit more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him He bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch, and he dries up, and they gather them, and they cast them into the fire, and they're burned. 
But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And these things I've spoken to you. So that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made full. Now this is my commandment that you love one another just as I've loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This I command you, that you love one another. The secret of loving is knowing. Look at John chapter 15, verses 14 and 15. Let me read it again. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. You know, there are some people people who become more precious to us the longer we know them. Have you, have you ever known somebody that when you first met him, you didn't really like him? I mean, maybe you met somebody at a gathering or a party or a church potluck and you reached for that deviled egg and somebody snatched it from in front of you and you immediately didn't like that person. And then you got to know them better and the more you got to know him, the more you liked him. And it might even reach a point where it might be a person you fell in love with. I mean, isn't that the premise of every Hallmark special in the world? <laughs> Is there any Hallmark special that started out with a man and a woman saying, I really like you? No. They hate each other. They try to kill each other, and then they both go to jail and meet up in jail, fall in love, and realize they were made for each other. The more you get to know somebody, in, in some cases, the better you like them. Someone said, young love is like a flame. It's very bright. It's very pretty. It's often very hot and fierce, but it's still only light and flickering. But the love of an older and disciplined heart is as coals, deep burning, unquenchable. What makes a difference? What makes a difference in the young love and the old love? And part of it is found in just the use of those words. The young love is new and it's short term, but the older love is longer term. Why do I love you more today than yesterday, but not as much as tomorrow? Time makes the difference in that setting. Time. Time which enables us to know each other better. So the secret to loving is knowing. Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to ask this question. How well do you know Jesus? Now, I want you to look at the question again, and I want you to hear what it's not asking. The question is not, what do you know about Jesus? 
It's not knowing about him, it's knowing him. How well do you know Jesus? At our, conver at our conversion, most of us really only know he's Lord. We know that he died for us, he's our savior, and he wants to be the ruler and master in our lives. And that's about all we know. Do you know him more than that now? Do you know him better than that now? I want you to listen to the words that Peter ends his second epistle with. Here's what he says. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, but grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's important for us to know him and to be continually growing in that knowledge, to be knowing him better today than we knew him yesterday or last year. When we became a Christian, and up until this very moment today, knowing him better. And how well, here's another question, how well do you plan to know him? I want you to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. If anybody knew Jesus, wouldn't it have been the Apostle Paul? I mean, for some two years he was taught by him in Arabia personally, by the Lord. I mean, Paul had an incredibly intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want you to listen to the words he gives at the end of his life in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Here's what he says. I'm sorry, chapter, um, chapter 3, verse, yeah, chapter 3 and verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself." I want you to think about that statement. I want you to also look at chapter 3, verse 12, where he's saying, I, I want to attain, I'm sorry, in verse 9, that I may be found in him, listen, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but from that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, that, listen, future statement, that I may know him. Paul, who knows the Lord, says, we all want to be looking eagerly to be like him. We, who already know so much about him, long to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Paul said that. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how well you may have studied the life of Christ. When, I, when you hear and when I read that statement, those two statements in Philippians, when I read those statements, it makes me conclude this. I don't care how well I know him, I need to know him better. If the Apostle Paul would say that, I need to know him better. I need to know him better so I can be more conformed to his will. Then I know Ralph Walker certainly needs to spend more time in knowing Jesus Christ. I, you know, sometimes, brethren, we, as we study our Bibles and we move through life knowing the Word, and we've done daily Bible readings maybe year after year after year, and we think we've got a pretty good handle on this, we start thirsting and wanting to know the deeper things, 
let's, let's wrestle with those areas that are somewhat controversial or a little deeper. Let's spend more time in those areas of the Bible that really challenge us and move our minds. And I'm telling you, get back to the biographies. Get back to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Immerse yourself in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, hear this, salvation is as much knowing the man as it is knowing his plan. Because his plan requires me to be conformed to the image of his will. And if I'm not working to know him and the relationship that I should have with him, such that, look, what's the difference in knowing about somebody and calling somebody a friend or a dear friend? The difference is knowing them more intimately, isn't it? Knowing somebody intimately, knowing the details of their life, bring them to the point of being a friend. Jesus says, I don't call you slaves, I call you friends. Because all the things he said that God has told me, I've shared with you. I've opened my life to you. And the same thing should be true for us, that Jesus has opened his life to us and we know him. Not know about him. He was born in Bethlehem and he went to Egypt and he was raised in Nazareth. And, and at the age of 12, he went to the temple and he began preaching about the age of 30. And he was baptized by John in the Jordan River. Facts, 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 but it doesn't tell us who he is. It's a great task of the Christian. Knowing Jesus. To know God. Because John said... No man has seen God at any time, but the Son has revealed him to us. If I want to know God, all I have to do is know Jesus, and I will know his heart and his mind. But what does it mean? You, you may say, okay, Ralph, I get it. What does it mean, though, to know Jesus? I mean, I don't have conversations with him. I don't invite him to go out to eat. I don't meet him at my house and we watch movies together. What do you mean when you say knowing Jesus? And I want to tell you, to know Jesus is to be like him. To know him, the reason I need to know him is so I can be like him. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29... Romans 8, verse 29, Paul says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become, listen to this, to become conformed to the image of his Son. To be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, the Apostle Paul can make this statement. Be imitators of me as I also am of Christ. How can Paul make that statement? You do what I do, and when you do, you'll be doing what Christ does. To live my life so closely in tune and in harmony with the life of Christ that when people follow me, they follow my Lord. Can we say that to people? If people say, well, what's Jesus like? Can we say, well, look at me. Paul said that. Be an imitator of me as I am of Christ. What if every disciple did exactly what you did? Every day in every way. What if they did that? What would this church look like? First of all, how many people would be here? Now, I know you said, well, I'm here tonight. And, and I understand that. But 
What about next week? What about next month? And, and what if everybody gave the way you gave? I don't necessarily mean the amount, but they gave the way you gave, and that's what Christ would do. And they cared about souls the way you care about souls, because that's the way Jesus cares about souls. And they know the word the way you know the word, because that's the way Jesus is the word. To know Jesus is to be like him. God not only wants us to like his son, he wants us to be like his son. You know, there's nobody could tell you more about me than Paula. I know some of you in this audience, and some of you I've gotten to know this week. But I'll guarantee you, if, if I were to offer some kind of quiz on Ralph Walker, my wife would beat every one of you. Why? Because she's smarter than all of you? No. It's because she just knows me. How does she know me? Because we spend time together. We invest ourselves in each other. So when we are knowing Jesus, the goal of that is to be like him. I got to tell you, when I was a kid, I played baseball. I wasn't great at baseball, but I played at it. And, and I remember one time receiving some coaching from our manager, and he was telling us how to steal second. Steal second base. And I wondered, would Jesus steal second base? I did. I wondered that. Would, would he do that? Would he steal second? Would, would Jesus watch some of the movies that I watch? Would Jesus tell jokes? Would Jesus tell a joke? Would he find that funny? And I want to tell you, as I've come to know him better, many of those kinds of questions have been answered for me. I, I think Jesus would have enjoyed a good joke like anybody else would have. I think he loved to laugh. And, and I think within the confines of the game, yeah, Jesus would steal second base. Listen, I'm not being irreverent about that. I'm not trying to be funny about that at all. I'm, I'm saying to you, I think if Jesus moved in our community the way we move and live in our community, there are many things that Jesus would do, and there are many things he would not do. He would not do. There are things I don't think Jesus would tolerate. I think there's some music that we listen to that Jesus would say, turn that off, that's not appropriate. I think there are movies we go to that Jesus, minutes into it, would say, I don't know why we came here, I'm leaving. I think I know that better now because I think I know my Lord better than I knew him when I was a kid. So to know Jesus is to know what would Jesus do if he were in my shoes. You know, that was really popular for a while, those bracelets. WWJD, what would Jesus do? But I'll tell you, that, that concept and those bracelets are only as valuable as our knowledge of Jesus. I, I, I have nothing against people who love animals. I, I love animals. But I think there are some people who, in their attempt to demonstrate why it's good to love animals, have gone too far. I, I saw a billboard one time, and it was put out by PETA, the Organization for the Protection for Animals, and it showed this picture of a beatific Jesus. I mean, it was a standard picture of Jesus with his arms outstretched, and it said, Jesus would never eat meat. Now, listen, I, here's, here's what I think those people said to themselves. Well, Jesus was a compassionate person. And as a compassionate person, he, he would value the life of every animal. And therefore, he wouldn't take the life of an animal to eat it. But they don't know Jesus. Because the Jesus that's in the Bible ate animals. 
I'm not saying he walked around the streets just bonking animals on the head and eating them raw. I'm not saying that. But Jesus ate animals. He was a Jew. He ate Passover lambs. He ate animal sacrifices. He did what Jews do. But it's only when you really know Jesus that you understand that. Not you think you know him. It's not I think I know his heart. The people that put that billboard up thought they knew his heart, but they didn't know him. So this what would Jesus do doesn't depend on, well, this is what I would do, and I think Jesus is nice like I'm nice. I think Jesus is helpful like I'm helpful. I think Jesus is kind like I'm kind, so I'm sure this is what Jesus would do. You're operating off a premise you have no right to operate off of. Know him from the word. He is clearly revealed in the Bible. God gave him to us for that reason. But secondly, to know Jesus is not only to be like him, it is to know myself. To know what my capabilities are. Jesus helps me find my potential. What I truly can be. You know, I can look at other people and compare myself to other people. But invariably that breaks down. It either breaks down because they fail like I fail, or I feel superior because I'm actually better than they are at some things. Comparing myself with other humans, normal humans, doesn't work because we're all fallible. But comparing myself to Jesus, now that's the ultimate mirror, mirror on the wall. Jesus shows me what I am. But not only my foibles and failures, but he also shows me my potential. Jesus shows me what I can be as I look at his life. Look at the potential reached by the twelve. Those ordinary men like you and me and what they achieved in the world. How? How did they achieve that? They didn't go to some school to learn that. They watched their master. So knowing him shows me what I can be. Knowing him shows me my weaknesses so I can work on them. That's what knowing Jesus can do. I can know myself. And and Jesus desires that we would know him better. Look again, one more time, at John chapter 15, verse 14. You are my friends. Friends. He wants us to know him better. He wants us to be his friends. I'm not making that trite. I'm not making that trite. I'm not taking anything away from his holiness or his power as a king. But it is amazing to me that the king of the kingdom would stoop and wash feet. For what purpose? Because their feet were dirty? No. To show them how they should serve each other. Jesus wants us to know him better. In John chapter 10, he says of himself, the sheep know my voice. Do you know the voice of Jesus? Listen, this is a hard lesson. (laughs) This is a hard lesson. Do you know the voice of Jesus? Would you recognize his voice? And by that, I don't mean tone. I mean what he would say. You know, there are some things you could go to my wife and say, Ralph said this, and she'd go, no, Ralph didn't say that. I know Ralph. He doesn't talk that way. He would not say that. If you went to Paula and you said, I heard Ralph say he loves liver, she'd say, "Mm -mm, you haven't been talking to my Ralph. The only liver my Ralph loves is his own. Do you know the voice of Jesus? Do you know what he wants you to do and what he doesn't want you to do? Can you recognize that in him? 
Jesus goes on to say, you don't cultivate relationships with slaves or servants. They're just there to do the bidding. You don't cultivate relationships with them. But he says, I don't call you slaves. I call you friends. And Jesus came here to reveal God to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of God. No man has seen God at any time, but the Son has revealed Him to us. That's what Jesus wants us to know. That's the life He wants us to live. And then He preserved His life in the Word. This written Word that we've been studying this week. Now, I want to show you one more passage, and then we're going to close. I'm back in Luke chapter 24. This passage has really begun to push me in areas of my life I've never been pushed before. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus encounters two disciples on the road to a city called Emmaus. It's about six or seven miles away from Jerusalem. And Jesus is resurrected from the dead. It's the first day of the week. And these two are on their way home. And Jesus meets up with them and he just starts walking with them. And he, and he says something about what concerns you. And they say, are you the only person that doesn't know what happened today? And they'd start telling him about Jesus, this man who was approved of God as a prophet. And they killed him in Jerusalem. In verse 25, Jesus says, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Now listen, here it is. Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. The scriptures that are being referred to here are the Old Testament. That's all they had. There's no Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. When Jesus says he began to teach them from Moses, and listen, all the prophets, all the prophets, the things concerning himself in all the scriptures, this whole book is about Jesus. This whole book, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the epistles or how to live the Christian life. This whole book, the book of Genesis, has Jesus in it. The book of Exodus has Jesus in it. And I want, I want to tell you, as I've taken the challenge, okay, if he's in all the scriptures, I'm going to start reading the scriptures, and I'm going to be looking for him every time. Where is Jesus in this story? Where is Jesus in this person? Where is Jesus in this incident? Where is Jesus in this symbol? Now, some of them are really obvious, and some are not quite as obvious. But the more you focus on it, the more it comes to light. Listen, I'm going to talk about something real quick that all of you who are around my age and anywhere around my age will know, but you younger people won't, so I need to explain it. There was a time when you could go into a mall or any kind of large shopping area and they'd have a kiosk and that kiosk had all these big posters that just looked like a conglomeration of colors or geometric shapes of all different colors. And you'd see people standing around looking at these pictures of nothing but just mottled, muddled colors or shapes. And then and then I remember the first time I saw that, all of a sudden a person would go, oh, I see it, I see it. 
And what they were were 3D pictures. And the only way you could see it was to so focus yourself, so focus your eyes on it, that you looked so hard at it that your vision almost became a little bit blurred, and then all of a sudden, there was the picture. There it was. And what looked like just a conglomeration of color was a shark or was a mountain scene with a, a sun in the distance and a waterfall. And you saw it and you think, how did I not see that before? I got so good at doing those pictures, I could go into a public bathroom and read the wallpaper. We need to focus our minds and our eyes and our hearts on all the scriptures. Not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the scriptures. Jesus is throughout the Bible. He's in the very obvious stories like Abraham offering Isaac. But he's also in the life of Noah. And Jesus is in Cain. In the story of Cain. And, and he's Abel. And he's Adam. And he's even Eve being tempted. And Jesus is in David. But he's not just in David. He's also in the story of Absalom. And you'll find him in some of the characters and figures. He's in the burning bush. And Jesus is in the brass serpent. And he's in the manna in the wilderness. And he's in the mercy seat. And the Ark of the Covenant. And the tabernacle itself over and over and over. You say, Ralph, how do you know that? Because I went back with the challenge that was given by Jesus. He began to teach them all that the scriptures said of him. For what purpose? Well, to know him is to love him. The more I know about my Lord, the more he becomes the most incredible being the world has ever seen. And so I want to know him that way so that I can love him. And to love him is to obey him. The more I love him, the easier it is to obey his word and his will. And the more I obey him, the easier it is to just abide in him, to just rest in him, to find my sustenance in him. And the more I abide in him, the more fruit I bear for him. It's just a natural progression, and to bear fruit for him is life. That's what we've been studying this week. That's what John 15 is telling us. If you want that kind of life, if you want life in Jesus Christ, it is found in knowing him, to love him, to obey him, to abide in him, and to bear fruit for him. If that means something to you tonight and you see deficit in your life that needs correcting, then take that up with the Lord. In your prayers tonight, make the adjustments so that you can know him, love him, obey him, abide in him, bear fruit for him. But if you need the prayers of the congregation, you need our help, then you certainly should come and ask for the prayers of the saints. Can we help you? Can we help you put on Christ tonight? Name him Lord and Savior? If so, you come to the front while we sing about this amazing Jesus. Let's stand.